Amen, amen. Thanks, Sam. Great job. Great job. Good morning, church. Yeah, good morning. You guys are learning. That's great. Um, I've noticed that, that uh, our, our church is growing and growing in size, and that's wonderful. But one thing that's not growing are the number of people that sit on the front row. So we, did, we've, we've got some extras down here, some newbies. Uh, so if you find that space is tight in the back, hey, come join us on the, the front row. Be part of the front row crew. That, those are my favorite people to connect with. But anyway, we, we are starting a, a thing called Be Rich. And to let a lot of you know what Be Rich is, because maybe not everyone knows what it is, it really is like a, a global initiative that we choose to be a part of. And it's something that churches all around the world, they do. And it has three components to it. And it's give, serve, and love. And we're going to be doing that over the next three weeks. But the point is, is that we get to be a part of something that's not just happening here in Cape Town, but that's happening globally. It's happening all over the world, kind of at different times in the year. But a lot of it is happening around this time of the year. Now, the idea behind Be Rich is that we want you to live a rich life. And, and we want you to know that there's a rich life out there for you to live. And yes, a lot of other people are going to benefit from this. So today as we talk about giving, there will be people that benefit from giving. And there will be people that benefit from serving. There will be people that benefit from loving. But I want you to know that the thing that I'm most concerned about, the thing that I'm the happiest about, is that you are going to benefit when you learn that you can live a rich life. See, we, we oftentimes think that we need money or something to be rich. But... You don't have to be rich to do good. Instead, it's doing good that leads to a rich life. And that's something that we're going to learn over the next three weeks. You don't have to be rich to do good. But it's doing good that leads to a rich life. And like I said, we're going to do that in three ways. We're going to do it through giving, serving, and loving. Now, I want this to be more than just a campaign. I want this to be more than just, here's South Point Church, and we've got this initiative, this campaign, and we're launching, and hoorah, we're going to go do it. And so I want you to know it's more than that. In fact, there's there's part of this that we as a church are compelled to do. See, as a pastor and as a a church, as South Point Church, we have a biblical responsibility to do this. So your responsibility or your part in it is you just get to come to church and enjoy But our part as a church is that we've actually been instructed, and especially we're going to look at it in 1 Timothy, we've been commanded to teach you about be rich, to teach you how to live a rich life. So let me show you where this comes from in Scripture. Just so that you know it's not the creative genius of of anyone's team, this is the creative genius of Jesus. And in 1 Timothy, he's writing, he says, command those who are rich in the things of this life, command those, that's us, that's me. That's my job. That's the church's job. We are to command you who are rich in life and the things of this life not to be proud, but to place their hope not in such uncertain things as riches, but in God who generously gives us everything for our enjoyment. Then he goes on in verse, the next verse says, command, so again, a command for me, command for the church, command them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share with others. In this way, they will store up for themselves a treasure which will be a solid foundation for the future. And then they will be able to win the life which is true life. So I love that line, they will be able to win the life which is true life. So as a church, we've been commanded to do this. We've been commanded to walk you through this. And, and the, the motivation behind Jesus for you, is that you win at life. There's a true life that he wants you to win at. So the question that we ask ourselves before we even start this is, who wants to win at life? I want to win at life. See, you may go out there and you may not feel like you're winning anywhere. You may not feel like you're winning in your family. You may not feel like you're winning as a parent. How many parents or moms or dads out there get to the end of the week or even the end of the day or just after breakfast and you just think, I've already kicked the dog. I've yelled at the kid. There's coffee all over the floor. Like Today's not my day. I'm just not winning at this. Or you go to work and, and, and your position at work is much lower than you think that it should be. And you're like, man, I can't, I can't win there. You're not winning in your personal relationships. You just feel like you keep messing things up. You know what? You can lose all you want out there. You can feel like a loser all you want out there. When you come in here, you're a winner. And when you come in here, Jesus' design for you is that you win. 
And his design for you is that you realize that this is the real life that you get to be a winner at, that none of that out there really matters. We obviously don't want to kick the dog, but, but just because your morning is crazy and you feel like you're not winning as a mom or as a dad or as a, as a parent of some kind, it, it doesn't, that doesn't determine whether you're winning at life. So the, the point is, is I want more for you. I want you to win. And it just so happens that, that Jesus, today we're talking about generosity, but there's a, a guy in the Bible that Jesus has an encounter with. And Jesus wants this guy to win at life, just like he wants us to win. And this guy comes to Jesus, and he's asking him questions, and he approaches Christ. And Jesus has this amazing heart for him, but but Jesus digs into his heart, digs into who he is and, and, and what he feels like he's winning at or not winning at. But Jesus so desperately wants this guy to win at life. And so we're going to look at this story and see how it applies to us. And then at the end, we're going to have a time where we can act on it. So the story that we're looking at today is found in Mark. Now, this is the story of the rich, young ruler. So think about a a, a young man who's got some wealth, has quite a lot of wealth, quite a lot of possessions, and maybe is in charge of a lot of different things, hence the rich, young ruler. And so this man, he hears about Jesus, and Jesus is on his way back to Jerusalem. And Jesus has been told, don't go to Jerusalem, something bad's going to happen there. We know, you know, because we've read the end of the book, that Jesus will be crucified there. And so Jesus is on his way there. And while he's on his way there, he's ministering, and he's doing things with people, and working in the crowds. And this guy comes up to Jesus in verse 17. He runs up to Jesus. And it says, as he was leaving on his journey, so Jesus, as he's leaving, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher. And and what good teacher means, when he uses that word, good teacher, see, see, words mean something. And so when he uses the word good teacher, he's saying, you who are essentially good and morally perfect. So he's saying, okay, you are the perfect good one, essentially the most morally perfect person that there is no, what, what grounds did he have to base that off of? See, maybe he's heard reputation of miracles. Maybe he's heard reputation of what Jesus has done as his ministry has happened, as healings have happened, and all of those things. And so he runs up and he makes an assumption. Good teacher. And so then he says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That is, eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom. So he wants to know, he's got got this issue. Hey, good teacher, the one that does miracles, the one that is morally perfect, what is it that I need to do to inherit this this kingdom that you keep talking about? So that seems like a really fair question. That seems like something that, well, that's not crazy that he would want to know that or he would want to ask that. He's got plenty of possessions. He's got plenty of money. We're going to soon find out that he's lived a pretty good life until he wants to know, what do I do? Just tell me what to do. And so Jesus' response in the next verse is so interesting. Jesus doesn't say, see, I love asking the Bible, why why did Jesus say that? So Jesus' response was, why do you call me good? No one is essentially good by nature except God alone. So Jesus, his response, why do you call me good? You know, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. You run up to a guy, hey, good teacher, hey, Messiah, hey, perfect one, how do I get into heaven? And Jesus looks at you and says, why do you, why, why do you call me good? And see, what's happening here is that, that this word that he meant for good was that he had to not only recognize that Jesus was morally perfect, but the, the, the young ruler was admitting by calling Jesus a good teacher That Jesus was the Lord and Savior. And so Jesus, before we even know what's happening, Jesus is digging into the heart of the young rich ruler. Because Jesus knows that in the young rich ruler, that he is not his Lord and Savior. So Jesus doesn't waste any time. That's why he doesn't answer his question right off the bat. The first thing he says is is he questions, why is it that you're calling me good? Because I see what's in your heart. I know what's going on in you. You can't call me good because I'm not your Lord and Savior yet. After I'm your Lord and Savior, then you can call me good. And so the story goes on in in verse 19. And this is Jesus responding to the guy. 
So he says, why, why is it that you call me good? And then he says to the man, you know the commandments. He's talking to him. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Jesus is saying, hey, you know all these commandments. He gives him five. These are five of the ten commandments. And then in response to that, the man says, yeah, 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 yeah. I know these commandments. I know them. And in verse 20, he actually says, he replied to him, teacher, I have carefully kept all of these commandments since my youth. This story seems like it's going really, really well. Jesus questioned his motives a little bit, but then said, hey, you know these commandments, you know, commandments one through five here. The guy's, yeah, I've done that, done it, ticked it off the list. Pretty good guy, kept these my whole life. Everything's going really well. I'm going to get into the Messiah's kingdom. It's going to be awesome. But then Jesus says something in verse 21. He says, looking at him. Now this to me struck me as a bit odd. I want you to imagine these two on a roadway. This conversation happening. And you have a man that wants to be in the kingdom of God. And then you have Jesus who sees straight through him to his heart. He knows everything in his heart, just like he knows everything in your heart. This morning when I got up and I prayed, Lord Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior, and I love you and I'll do anything for you. Jesus said, you won't do anything for me. I know you have a line. I know you have a limit. But he, but he loves me anyway. Just like we see in here. Jesus, he looks at him. And Jesus felt a love. And that love was a high regard, meaning that man mattered to him. It means that you matter to him. He felt this high regard for this guy, and he felt compassion for him. And he says, you lack one thing. You've asked the right question. You've approached the right guy. You've kept the commandments, but you lack one thing. And then he says, go and sell all of your property and give the money to the poor and you will have abundant treasure in heaven. And then he goes on to say, And come, follow me. And what Jesus meant by follow me wasn't necessarily walking you know, next to him. It was becoming his disciple, believing and trusting in Jesus, and walking the same path of life that Jesus walked, which is kind of like what we talk about with baptism. You're aligning yourself with Jesus and with the path that Jesus is walking and the way that Jesus is living out his life. Now, I want you to focus in on that moment, on this dusty road where these two are together and Jesus is filled with compassion and he's filled with love. And he looks at him and he says, you lack one thing. There's one thing that you don't have. See, Jesus knew that this one thing was the reason why the man could not call him a good teacher. Because this one thing was the reason why the man could not call Jesus Lord and Savior. And then in verse 22, in a very sad, sad way, the man, but the man was saddened at Jesus' words. It wasn't the answer that he wanted. And he left grieving now, this word grieving, what do we do when we grieve? We grieve something that has happened that's been taken from us that we didn't necessarily have control over. If you think about the things that you grieve, somebody passing or a job you didn't get or, or somebody's broken up with you in a relationship, you didn't necessarily have control over that. It's a sad thing that's happened to you that was out of your control and out of your, out of your hands. And you grieve, you know, you grieve the hurt that somebody caused you. It, it's, it's a grieving it's not, it's not something that you've done. And this man, he left grieving because it felt like to him he didn't have any control over making Jesus his Lord and Savior because he owned much property and he had many possessions which he treasured more than his relationship with God. That's where the grieving comes in because this man felt like no matter what, he was a victim to this because he could not confess Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He just couldn't do it. That was the one thing that the man lacked, was he couldn't get over the idea of letting Jesus be his treasure 
rather than his possessions being his treasure. And so then in verse 23, Jesus kind of continues this conversation. And he looks around, and he probably knows that his disciples are probably a little bit like, what's going on here? What exactly is happening here? Normally people come to Jesus, and they ask for healing, and he gives it to them. And here, this has happened. This guy said, hey, I want to be in your kingdom, and he's got money. Money would be great. Rich people are amazing. They take their money. They give their money to us. We do things with that money. Jesus, what is going on here? And so Jesus needs to clarify something to the disciples. And this is something that we need to clarify to us. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to take this message and convince all of you out there, or try and convince all of you out there, you need to sell everything you have and give it to Jesus and then go off and you know, live a certain way. That's just going to make everybody mad. And it should make you mad because that's not what the Bible is telling you to do. See, the, Jesus is speaking directly to one man's heart. And this man had something else in place as his Savior than Jesus. It didn't matter what it was. It could be a relationship. It could be money. It could be, um, it could be alcoholism or pornography. Or it, it could be whatever it is in your life that you go to for comfort, that you find your treasure in. Whatever that is, that's what Jesus is speaking to here. Now, for this man specifically, Jesus is talking about money, and I think it's important that he does talk about money. If you look at our society today, it's incredibly financially driven. It's, it's incredibly you know, driven by, by status and by, by money, by how much money you have or how much you don't have, your aspirations for more money, uh, being sad that you don't have the money that you wish that you had. And so Jesus is speaking directly to this guy about money, and now he needs to clarify to his disciples Here's why this money thing does matter. It doesn't have to be money, but here's why this money thing actually really does matter. And so he looks around and he says to his, his disciples, you guys go back a verse to, to 23 there, how difficult it will be for those who are wealthy because they cling to possessions and status as security to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus did not say, how difficult will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? See, this is why I love the Amplified Bible, because the Amplified Bible takes these words and it expands on what their meaning is. So the word wealthy here, that the way that Jesus is referencing this, is he's saying it's not just that you have money. It's that you have money and you cling to your possessions and status as security. So he's speaking to the wealthy person that clings to their finances that clings to their possessions as their security because that's the one thing that the man lacked. He couldn't let that go so that Jesus could fill the space in his heart that brought security and brought hope. Jesus wasn't his treasure, his possessions were. And so the disciples have it explained to him. It will be really difficult for people that cling to money as their security to enter heaven. And he goes on in verse 24. The disciples, they were amazed and bewildered by his words. You know why? Because the disciples were taught, especially in Jewish culture, that the more money you had, the more blessing from God that you had. The more money you had, the better sacrifice you could buy. So those with money obviously are blessed by God. And so Jesus is kind of turning all that around on its heads. And Jesus says to them, children. So he's, he's addressing them not as men. Hey, grown men. No, he's children. He's calling grown men children. He says, children, how difficult it is for those who place their hope and confidence in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And he goes on in the next verse, and he says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man who, this is important, who places his faith in wealth or status to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, guys, this is a big problem that people have is when you put your security in your finances or in your wealth, or you put your security in your possessions or in your property, it's really, really hard to make Jesus your Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong with owning things. You can have as much property in the world as you want. You can have as much money in the world as you want. In fact, I pray every day that you guys all get super rich, because if you guys all get super rich, we're going to benefit from it. So I hope you all make more money. I hope you all get raises, and I hope you all buy more property and, and all of that stuff. That's not the problem. 
That's absolutely not the problem. If you're wealthy, if you've got money in your checking account or whatever, your investments, don't you dare walk out of here feeling condemned or convicted by it because that's not what this message is about. What this message is about is Jesus pursuing the heart of a man that wanted to be in his kingdom but couldn't because he had replaced something that Jesus was meant to fill. He had replaced it with finances, with money, and with possessions. And that's what Jesus is trying to get the disciples to understand. You know, when, when Casey, I'll tell you a personal story. When Casey and I were called to Cape Town, we, we drove around the city and we were looking, okay, where does God want us to be? And we didn't know anything about Cape Town, nothing. We stayed in, in Newlands the first time that we came. We stayed in an Airbnb and we didn't know that Newlands was a wealthy place. It was just the cheapest Airbnb. It was 200 Rand a night. We were like, awesome. So we stay in this Airbnb, and God is sort of setting up our boundaries for where He wants us to, to, to be and, and who He wants us to reach. And i never forget that God said, Chris, I'm going to call you and Casey to the hardest to reach. Now, you know what that means? The hardest to reach is not out in a township somewhere or out, you know, where, wherever. The hardest to reach are those that have put their hope and their faith in their riches. The hardest to reach, dare I say, live in the southern suburbs. The hardest to reach are those that have said, my money, my wealth, that is my security. So I have a huge heart. I spent years before we uh, were brought on here with, with South Point Church, before we had anything, I spent years walking down through Bishop's Court in Newlands, laying my hands on gates and praying for people's houses through the walls and, and getting chased on by security guards and all that stuff. And I just thought, how, how long has it been since a revival broke out across Cape Town? You know what's amazing to me in Bishop's Court is you have a representation of almost every embassy that there is. Just imagine if revival breaks out in Bishop's Court. And then we get access to all these other places around the world. I mean, come on. But that's hard work. Those are hard areas to reach. And I don't want to see those people come to heaven and say in front of Jesus, and Jesus say to them, you lacked one thing. You made something else, your treasure, your confidence. Now, if you live in, there are good people that live in, in rich places. Again, I'm going to over clarify this a million times. There is no condemnation and no conviction for me about where you live or about how much money you have. This is between, so God told us, the church, to command you in this. This is between you and God. You know where you sit with your, with your treasure. You know what makes you feel comfortable and what makes you safe. I don't know. But Jesus is sure talking about this a lot. So I'm not going to ignore it. We're going to talk about it. And so then Jesus goes on here in the, in the next verse, in verse 26. The disciples, they're completely and utterly astonished. And they say to him, then who can actually be saved from the wrath of God? Now, they're probably sweating a little bit because Peter, a disciple, he owned a fishing business. So Peter's like, I have possessions. Uh-oh, am I going to get... Throwing, am I going to not be in heaven? Am I? And so they're, they're, like, they're, they're a little bit stressed about this. They're saying, well, then who can be saved? Who, who can go to heaven? Because this guy had everything that, that, that we thought he should have. He followed all the commandments. He was wealthy. He was blessed. He was a nice person. He's coming to Jesus, and he's begging Jesus to get into heaven. And, and he doesn't get into heaven? Then who else is going to get into heaven? And see, that, that makes me think about Paul. See, in, in Philippians 3.16, I don't have a verse for you, but Paul, he was sent out to persecute Christians because he was the best or one of the best Jewish Pharisees that there were. Paul kept the commandments to a T. He had the Bible or the Old Testament, the scrolls and scriptures memorized to a T. Paul's walking around purifying, purifying out the imperfection that is this Christian movement called the way in order to preserve the Jewish culture, the Jewish law. So here you have Paul perfectly following the commandments, perfectly following the, the, the Jewish text and the law, and he's persecuting people, persecuting Christians. 
So, so that this whole idea of what Jesus is doing, he's flipping things around on us. And he's saying, all that stuff doesn't matter. You can be as perfect as you think that you are. But I want to know what's in your heart. I want to know if what's in your heart, if what you put your treasure in, is it me? Because if it's not me, you lack one thing. The one thing you lack is a Savior who loves you and who grieves for you and who's compassionate for you, who wants to be your one thing. And so then, in verse 27, Jesus, he needs to answer his disciples, as they're probably totally rattled. They're like, we, we don't know up from down. We don't know what's going on here. In verse 27, Jesus looks at him, and he says, with people, as far as it depends on them, it's impossible. So he says, no matter what you do, you can never get into heaven. Just like the rich young ruler walking up to Jesus. How do I get into heaven? Tell me how. What's impossible? On your own power, on your own might, in your own treasure, in your own security, it's impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things are possible. And we translate this verse as, with God, all things are possible. And we apply that to a whole bunch of different things in our life that try and, and, and bolster our faith. But what Jesus is talking about here in this verse is, with God, your salvation is made possible. Because with God, you no longer lack that one thing. You have that one thing. So what, what we learn from this story here is that Jesus wants you to win at life. He wanted the rich young ruler to win at life. Jesus' heart and desire was for you to win at life. So no matter how you feel out there, when you walk in here, I hope and I pray that you know that Jesus wants you to win at life, meaning you get the life, that, that, that the real life that Jesus has for you, the real life that matters to you, just like he wanted the rich young ruler to win at life. So today, we're talking in Be Rich about being generous. And generosity is, is, is a huge part of living a rich life. I, I don't know how many of you know, but it's Casey uh, and I have, have spent time with you. Many of you know that, that Casey and I have lived on donor support for over 10 years. We've been able to be um, in the mission field. We've been able to, to, to work in churches. We've been able to do things because of the generosity of other people. This building that you sit in now was made available because there was huge generosity. People that gave millions of rands for us to sit in this building. See, the kingdom of God is built on enormous generosity. Now, I, I don't want you just to hear it from me. I want you to hear it from some people that are in our church. People that have a generous heart. And so we, we took some time and we sat down with them and we put together a little video. But I want you to hear from them, not from just the, the preacher, the guy that's up here, but from, from people that are sitting in seats with you. I want you to hear from them their perspective on a generous heart. So we're going to cut the lights down and turn on a video. And you guys, please turn your attention to the screen. So I'm Warren Anthony, um, I'm a sales representative, um, we distribute food products niche market to the niche market, uh, to spas and other stores like food lovers, yeah, and I'm married to Olivia for 20 years, 20 plus years. We've got three kids, Joshua, Jesse, and Ezra. So um, would you like just uh, telling the people, yeah, who is um, Sean, who's Esther? 
Yeah, just about that. You can start. Okay, I'm Sean Freeman. I am I am quite old, 34 years old. We've got two children. Jordan is 15 and Tamron is five. I'm Olivia and I'm an operations administrator for a tracking company. And for security purpose, I want to split um, say which company I'm working for. Esther's very young and she's also 44 years old. I'm not old. Oh, I the same as Sean, we are 10 years, we have two kids. Um, I work for the Dutch Reformed Church in Rondebosch in a church office and that's who I am. The first question to you guys is, uh, what does it mean to you uh, to give and to give generously? You know, this could be money, time, maybe an area of things such as service. Must I answer? Can start. Um, you know what, it's coming from me, it's very easy to give. I give very easily. Um, for me, um, giving, um, I think, is something that is part of who I am and it's easier for me to do than it is for my husband um, in my personality. But giving generously, um, for me, means um, that it has to cost you some. It's, it's doing something that costs you something. And um, in the end, um, I think seeing that it made a difference, that is what makes it worthwhile. So for me to give generously, it must come from the heart and it must come from a place of love. Um, giving your time, giving your money, whatever you want to give, when you give, to me it is you're sowing a seed. It might not be a seed that you see coming to fruition, but it's a seed you are planting. And when uh, my dad always used to tell us that when you take care of God's business, because God's business is in giving, we, we have to be there for others. And so when we serve others, when we take care of God's business, we'll take care of our business. Yeah, uh, generosity shouldn't be about um waiting for results or expecting something in return but it does help to see a result of generosity because like she said it's, it's it's nice to see a change in someone's life because of generosity and that ultimately does more for you than it actually does for that person by being generous so that's what we've experienced sure i think for me giving generously just uh, there, there can never be any regrets, or, or there should not be any regrets. I've never regretted um, giving. Um, and so, because as I mentioned earlier, it brings so much joy to oneself. Mm -hmm. And even if, you, even if you don't get a thank you, or you don't see the appreciation, um, there are many other ways where you will, will as I love you, frequently mentioned seed so you don't always it doesn't you don't always see the the, the, the fruit of, of, of that seed that you planted and it might be after many years and 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 we have seen that um, where we have sown into people's lives and we might not have seen the the results immediately but when we look back now or, or we you know, we oftentimes hear testimonies of those, and and so, yeah, giving generously. There's never any regrets. You might wonder and you might think, did I do the right thing? But I don't think, uh, you know, that you, you you can ever have any um, regrets concerning giving, um, giving to God, in particular, giving to the church. There can never be this. There should never be regrets for that, um, because um, I think at the end of the day, um, we might not see the rewards here, but we will see the rewards one day in heaven, and that is uh, emot that's motivation enough for me and for us as a family. You know, those are, those are four of the richest people that I know. It's not their possessions that make them rich. 
but it's their heart and their attitude. And I love what they said at the end, where, where there will never be a regret to your generosity. You're never going to regret being generous. So today, what I have for you is, is, is there a rich young ruler in you? Is it in your finances? Is it in your relationships? Is it in um, what you turn to for comfort and for treasure? Is it in another person? But where are you a rich young ruler? And specifically around giving. What have you put your treasure in? And see, I love listening to stories like Sean and Esther and Olivia and Warren about just this idea of, of, of generosity being easy and this idea of generosity being sowing seeds. I mean, could you imagine if we, if we have 155, 160 people in this room right now and then each person goes out and sows a seed and then that doubles to 300 and then those 300 go out and they sow a seed and that doubles and that doubles and that doubles. You know what happens? When, when more people get to heaven, they don't hear that word. They don't hear that phrase, but you lacked one thing. See, that's why this matters to me. God can give us all the money in the world. But what matters to me the most is that we do everything that we can do. And we're doing it through generosity this week. To keep people from getting to heaven and hearing that phrase. But you lacked one thing. And so there's going to be an opportunity today, and we've vetted it out. Um, we've picked out the Red Cross Children's Hospital, um, and we'll be raising money for the Red Cross Children's Hospital. We, we spoke to them on the phone, and, and they said that they're trying to build a therapeutic playground for kids, and, um, and that, that, they, that was their biggest need right now, their biggest initiative. And, and we said, okay, amazing. We want to get on board behind that. And so what we're asking from you guys is, is we would love to give 15,000 rand to them. We would love if everyone can give 100 rand. If you can't give 100 rand, give 10 rand. If you can't give 10 rand, give 2 rand. If you can give 15,000 rand, give 15,000 rand. You know, it's like it, being generous and sowing those seeds is not about the money. It's about what's happening between you and God. And what God is speaking to you about. Now, I, we've got one more opportunity for you, which I, I may be the, um, the richest human alive. It's, um, it's hard for me because I know the story. You don't, but, but I do. And there's a, a, a little girl named Mia, and she was already raising uh, an initiative. She was already doing something. She wasn't waiting on the church. She, she wasn't worried about whether or not the church was going to do it. She was going to do it. And she worked with her mom and dad, and she put together a little video, and she wanted to, to collect toys for kids at the children's hospital, because they had a story in their life where they spent time there. You know, when you encounter the purity of a generous person. I mean, look at the seed that it sows in me. Can you imagine what we can do to the rest of the city out there? So we're going to play Mia's video for you so you guys can turn your eyes to the screen. Just like that to the school right now. 
we think it can be very scary. So we thought we could do something small, just to make them smile and count the little tomatoes. That's what this is all about. Cuddly is for grace. We can't solve all the problems in the world, but just a little bit of kindness goes a long way. Check out the end of this video of how you can help. And remember, it's better to do a little bit of something than a whole lot of nothing. Bye! Thank you! Yeah. That's, that's precious. That's precious. I've, so, Mia was doing this. South Point had nothing to do with that. that that's her. We just heard about it and said we want to get behind it. And so uh, she had done her own video, and we just reshot it um, so that we could get good audio for you guys. But um, how rich? How many seeds come out of that? I mean, it's amazing. So I, I want to leave you with a verse, and then I'll leave you with a, a couple options. And this, this verse is 2 Corinthians. And this is, this is for you. This is, this is so that you know this message is not about condemnation. It's let each one give thoughtfully with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. I think that there could be a line added and say, comma, Mia at the end of that. So your, your two options for today, the two things that we're really pushing, we'll put on the screen for you. One is, is you can give, you can give 100 rand, um, you can give 50 rand, 10 rand, whatever it is that you have the ability to give. It goes to Red Cross Children's Hospital. When you walk out of the auditorium doors, on your right, you'll see a, a, someone holding a give sign. We've got a box for you to put cash donations in. We've got SnapScan. We've got our banking details. And then we've, we've, got, we've printed out uh, and put a whole bunch of information about the playground up there uh, so that you know exactly, exactly, exactly what the, the Children's Hospital is planning on doing with those donations. And then the other thing is this Cuddly's for Grace is next week, can we bring in toys? I mean, how amazing would it be if we had to rent a truck to take all the toys to the children's hospital with them? You know, can... <laughs> so, I mean, th th this is what I'm excited about. Money's great and all, but this is the one that, I, that I'm the most excited about. Um... I'm going to pray for us so I can get the mess that I am off stage. <laughs> and, um, and the band's going to come out. They're going to lead us in a song. Heavenly Father, I just pray that...